questions generated at the March 10th, 2021 faculty meeting in roughly ranked order and grouped by theme, with responses provided by Interim Provost David McAvetty in italics, with information as it is understood as of 3-19-2021. What is the plan for senior leadership to deal with enrollment crisis other than cutting faculty and staff? What admin cuts will be implemented? Answer. A lot of our work is oriented towards stabilizing and then growing enrollment. This is the purpose of our renewal initiatives and new academic directions. Those are capitalized, new academic directions. It's like a program that they're running. We are engaging in partnerships with local school districts and community colleges to reach out to those potential students who may be hesitant about participating in higher education right now due to COVID-19 and economic uncertainty. Even if all these initiatives are successful, it will take several years to rebuild enrollment. In the meantime, we need to align spending with revenue. Higher education is a sector that operates mainly through the work of staff and faculty. Staff and faculty salary make up over 80% of our operating budget. We will need to restructure as a smaller institution to reflect the number of students we support. See below for ways that we will do this. Question A with a following answer. I am concerned that cuts to programs will only worsen the problems, and we also need strong advertising for college. What are the administration plans to both keep back cuts that will hurt students' options and expand what we are doing to the outer world? Yes, there is a concern that the deep cuts that are needed will further reduce student enrollment. To mitigate this potential, we will aim to make reductions in areas that will create the least negative impact to student enrollment. There are no good options. We will also invest in the most cost-effective new academic directions that will grow enrollment. Evergreen's marketing and advertising is at an all-time high in terms of quality and quantity. They basically run paid uh, articles, which are really advertisements in a local online newspaper called Thurston Talk. They also... Uh, suppress negative reportage, such as yours truly, from uh, showing up in Google search results and other things that I'm sure that they are sprinkling their advertisement throughout the land to continue. And those teams are building and directing campaigns to attract students and remind stakeholders of the value we bring to the state, uh, petitioning the legislature to continue their funding, even though they are hemorrhaging it and not able to pay it back or do well with what the state is giving them. Question two. Between 2012 and 2018, our enrollments plummeted by more than 1,182 students. Why did the number of people earning more than 100K at the college in that period almost triple, jumping from 9 in 2012 to 26 in 2018 for an increased salary expenditure that totals almost $2.5 million? The increase from 9 to 26 positions, earning more than 100K between fiscal year 2012 and fiscal year 2018, is mostly about cost of living allowance raising the salaries of all employees bringing the salaries of some of those earning less than 100K above 100K, as can be seen by directly comparing positions. It is not the case that 15 new high paid positions were added. It should also be noted that data from OFM includes several well paid positions from WSIPP and COP that are not part of Evergreen's operations or budgetary purview. It is true that some new senior level positions were added between 2012 and 2018, including the Vice President for Inclusive Excellence and Student Success, the Vice President for College Relations, and Vice President for Indigenous Arts and Education. I will keep this board and senior leadership up to date on messaging and provide future and current talking points as we learn more about next steps for the state budget and prepare for future sessions. Please use the messaging I will continue to provide and please keep me informed of any conversation you have or may have with the legislator or the governor's office. 
By doing so, I can effectively plan how that fits into our overall strategy, and that will help make us successful. A senior advisor to the president was hired as a temporary position following spring 2017. The funding for these was partially provided by funds from lower-level vacant positions, partly from grants and partly from reserves. Some new operating funds to support these positions were allocated, but substantially less than $2.5 million. C2B for actions taken since 2018. Why has the question about increases in number of senior leadership positions and cost while student numbers have declined not been addressed? See above and below for responses to this question. B. What is the Evergreen State College going to do about salaries over 100K? Answer. One thing we have done since fiscal year 2018 is reduce the number of senior level positions. Oh, really? We eliminated the vice president for student affairs position and the president's chief of staff position. We combined the AVP for academic operations and the budget dean position into a new vice provost position, reducing two senior positions to one. We've also lost other senior positions in facilities and computing and communications with salaries in this range. We expect for the reductions in the number of executive staff positions this coming year with the loss of the president. I'm sure they're going to hire another one, but he's on his way out finally and on his terms. And a reduction of at least one academic dean position by July 2022. This year, the senior executive staff took a 10% reduction in salary of which 5.4% was a permanent compensation reduction and 4.6% was furloughed of 12 days a year, the same as other staff. The provost, vice provost, deans, and faculty directors are all taking 20 days of furlough rather than 12, which is a 10% reduction over the academic year. 2C. Can we have an updated, accurate org chart of the entire college to refer to when considering areas, positions for cuts, growth areas, and to visually see, to visually see senior leadership's portfolios? Yes, here is the organizational chart as of October 2020. Let's look at this thing. Look at this. Okay, so the uh, Vice President for Inclusive Excellence and Student Success has one administrative s assistant, a Dean of Inclusive Excellence and mm, Student Success, uh, and a Director of the First Peoples Multicultural Trans and Queer Services, and Director of Climate and Belonging Education in Durham. <laughs> They just keep on adding words to that position. Director of Access Services, Director of TRIO Student Support Services, which was Felix's old position. Director of Academic and Career Advising, hmm, which is under student success, interestingly enough. And Interim Associate Director in Academic and Career Advising, Interim. <laughs> Question three, what is the process by which we will lay off faculty and staff? Dun, dun, dun. We will be following our collective bargaining agreements for represented employees. For faculty, layoffs are part of the reduction in force, RIF, policy in the CBA, which specifies that greater faculty layoffs would require a declaration of financial exigency or emergency. Are we there yet? Details are in Articles 23.3 and 23.4 of the Faculty Collective Bargaining Agreement. A. George Bridges mentioned firing faculty. Will that be a RIF, reduction in force, or straight out firing outside of financial exigency? Answer. We will not be firing faculty. George did mention potential layoffs. Faculty layoffs are governed by the faculty CBA, which specifies that layoffs of regular faculty require a declaration of financial exigency or emergency. See above. We will need to reduce the number of budgeted faculty lines to a level appropriate to the number of students. We also need to create a spending plan that matches revenue. The administration will work with the United Faculty of Evergreen on solutions to the current imbalance. So we are not firing anybody, but there will be layoffs. But we're not firing anybody unless we declare financial exigency, which we're not going to do because that would give us bad press. We ran it by our marketing department. We're not going to declare, declare financial exigency. We're not going to do it. We promise. And we're not going to fire anybody. There just will be some layoffs. Question 3B. 
Instead of cuts to faculty, cap salaries temporarily for two to three years at 110k or thereabouts, accepting new president and provost? Interesting suggestion, answers David McAvetty. We have reduced the salaries of executive staff this year. In principle, reducing salaries of some senior employees too sharply would create wage compression that would be problematic. These employees are not overpaid relative to peers, so this would also create staff recruitment and retention challenges, some of which we are already seeing. People are fleeing because this college is tanking and they're not going to declare exigency <laughs> and we're not going to fire anybody. We're just going to like slowly pressure everybody out uh, compared to market forces. We won't be able to get anybody back, so we have to keep the salaries high. Uh, this is not a good position to be in. Q tiny tractor grabber dirt thing next to huge boat with evergreen painted on the side. See question 2B for other actions we have taken and plan to take that are in this vein. The college needs to reduce its spending by close to 9 million over the next year. OMG. Reductions of the kind proposed here would be a relatively small proportion of such a reduction and thus would not obviate the need to reduce budget faculty lines. We're not going to fire anybody until we declare financial exigency, which is upon the horizon. Four. Question four. How do we plan for the fall and the whole year ahead, not knowing what budget cuts, staff resources, furloughs are on the horizon? Answer. We recognize the order for budget planning does not always align with the best order for curriculum planning. We will need to plan for fall with some uncertainty and some contingencies, not exigencies, contingencies, not least because of the pandemic. We are looking at a biennial approach to budget reductions. We may need to phase in some reductions around the plans that are developed to prepare for return to more in-person instruction in fall quarter. The, uh, the faculties, the actual physical grounds, the facilities, I'm sorry. So there's the faculty, which the faculty are worried about the faculty, but the facilities are actually very, very expensive and they're not being used because of the whole COVID thing. To continue, it would help make for more timely planning if faculty could work collaborative, collaboratively with staff and by responding to requests in a timely way. They appreciate when you do. Okay, faculty, get with it, guys. Stop being so evergreen. Question 4a, can leadership prioritize time for faculty and academic staff to plan collaboratively, why am I having a hard time with that word, for both NAD, new academic directions, Evergreen just has this thing, I guess it's just a government bureaucracy thing, they're just always making new things that they can have a new acronym to throw around. Here's a new acronym, new academic directions. It's like, it's the cover for like scrambling, it's just the cover for panic. <laughs> To continue, uh, can leadership prioritize time for faculty and academic staff uh, to work collaboratively for both NAD and to adjust to deep cuts to resources? We must and we will, comes the answer. We will share information in a few weeks about how we are prioritizing new academic directions work for spring. We will also explain our approach to budget reductions and our process for collaborative planning and feedback. Question 4b. Plan for one quarter leaves every two years for faculty. For real time off and ability to collect unemployment? Should we plan for one quarter leaves for every two years for faculty? Answer. We account for the number of voluntary leave without pay, LWOP, love the acronyms, each year before making decisions about needed faculty salary lines. We appreciate those who can and do volunteer to take a LWOP because it reduces the size of the faculty salary deficit and in turn helps faculty who are not in a financial position to do this. The suggestion to consider LWOP a quarter at a time as alternative form of furlough so that faculty who are furloughed can collect unemployment benefits is well taken. So basically shift the burden of the state college onto the state itself. So you have like this rolling unemployment thing to keep faculty engaged in Evergreen, which just is a bigger burden on the state in order to keep their ship afloat or off bank. Interesting. To continue, unemployment benefits are subject to state rules. Okay, there we go. 
It is unclear if such a measure would qualify. To be clear, this idea is a working condition, so would need to be taken up with the United Faculty of Evergreen. Question five. How do you see new academic directions increasing enrollment and on what timeline? What is the actual substance of new academic directions? We are moving forward with a strong two-year project plan for new academic directions. We are at the early stages of implementation, so impact on fall 2021 enrollment and retention is likely to be small relative to the strong winds. Oh my God, associated with COVID-19. Okay, there's a little pun there. Strong winds is how Evergreen, well, the Ever Given ship is like got banked into the Suez Canal. So I guess those strong winds were COVID-19, but... Uh, the, the ship lost power, and that was the Evergreen Spring in 2017. So they were already adrift, and then the s strong wind came by and just banked them. I wonder what the sound was of that uh, Ever Given uh, ship beaching. We will be rolling out full implementation of the major enrollment initiatives of new academic directions, paths, certificates, hybrid online pathways to degree, and professional studies in 21-22. The earliest we would see a big enrollment impact, notice that big enrollment impact is not an acronym, but it should be. It's almost, yeah, it's B-E-I, kind of like D-E-I, big enrollment impact in the 100s of new students. Hundreds! There's hundreds of them coming back would be fall 2022. So the, the earliest they're going to see any sort of change is 2022. And I doubt that they're going to see that change. That is an ambitious target, so uh, get your expectations low, and will require a singular focus on timely decision-making, planning, and implementation in the next 6 to 12 months in order to reach this goal. That is our window. Question six. What does the comment in the update State of the College Address mean? Quote, and I'm sorry, uh, viewers, I didn't record the State of College Address. I do this every year, and they did this online, and they didn't record it because they know that I do this every year. They know what I do because I'm an evergreen grad. And they're, really, they're really keyed in to uh, their alum, alums, uh, especially me. At least their marketing department is. Anyway, so I, I didn't uh, record that. They, they just zoomed it, and I didn't see the email that was going to invite me to it um, until it was too late. So I don't have that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. So we're doing this very dry take right now. Let's reread question six. What does the comment in the update slash state of the college address mean? Quote, we will have to change what and how we teach. What does this refer to? specifically. Let's see how specifically McAvity does. Our college is built for 5,000 students. Enrollment is now 2,000 students. We will have fewer than 2,000 next year and do not expect significant growth above this figure for several years. This is an existential moment for us. What and how we teach works great for some students. There are students out there for whom it does not work as well. We will need to consider some new approaches for other students. Maybe not denigrating them for being white and male. Maybe, maybe taking that air of oppressive campus climate out of there. No, actually, they're doubling down on that, and they're, they're still doing this day of absence thing. It's not the day of absence anymore. It's an equity symposium. And in perfectly unintended evergreen irony, this year's equity symposium is titled Wade in the Water, as though her famed canoe has been beached, and now they are forced to go clamming in their booties. Also, in perfect evergreen fashion, this year's keynote speaker, alike last year's keynote speaker, is a radically racializing activist that divides the entire world based on categories of privilege and oppression and seeks to overthrow the status quo, which is exactly what got evergreen into all of this mess. Here's selections from last year's keynote speaker and this year's keynote speaker saying the same old thing. Intersectionality was created by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, the goal of which was to explain what it means when people have intersecting identities, especially those who have intersecting identities that are oppressed. When that's happening, it's a compounding experience of oppression. 
I also take this to push me to think about intersectionality on the privilege front. Some of us in this room have intersecting identities that have privilege, which means our privilege is also compounding, which means we also have now the compounding extra visor. You know like how horses wear sometimes to keep them in a straight line? Some of y'all got really big ones of those and are walking in an extra straight line. So our goal is to get you to take those off, or my goal is, by thinking about your story. Everyone's sort of born into a kind of uh, scripted existence that is defined uh, by these power structures. Uh, more often than not, we live in defiance of this design. Remember that part of how the status quo exists and part of how racial hierarchies are maintained are by defining our existence through denying our truth. So we're not going to allow the powers that be to define our existence. We're not going to allow them to define our truth. So we know that the attack that happened in Atlanta was racially motivated. We know this in our bones. We are experts in this, not just because we've experienced racism, but because we have studied, we know in our bones. Our job is to help elevate those voices, this struggle, the justice that happens. So we aren't going to prove to people who are deeply invested in denying our reality that racism in fact exists. I mean, that infuriated me. That infuriated me. We cannot give up the reins. We cannot give up the reins. We are our best resource. We are our best resource. Anytime we come together, we are a threat to the status quo. Anytime that we fight together. Build community. Find the other people who want to disrupt and dismantle as much as you do and make it fun. I'm with other radical people who want to see a radically transformed world. And when I look at the news and I see like cities all over the world right now are, are rising up, we're about to reach the 20 year mark of WTO in Seattle. Sometimes it takes people willing to crack it open to make the change. And history has taught me those are the people that silently suffer the most. Grievance culture might be what they need to take out of the college environment to attract students in a state that is 70% white that knows that this college, anybody that does research on this college, knows that if you are white, you are on the bottom of the totem pole because Evergreen judges people based on the color of their skin and puts content of character on the back burner, as we can see with the content of character of the head of the administration, George Bridges, and the Evergreen Spring, which showcased to the world the content and the outgrowth of diversity, equity, and inclusion as implemented at the Evergreen State College. Maybe that is something that you could change. Maybe. No, not going to happen. Where were we? We will need to consider some new approaches for other students. Supporting certificates, remote or hybrid education, and professional studies are the priorities we set with our New Directions conceptual plan late last June. We must act on these and build structures to support them. The college did a similar kind of re-envisioning during the last big enrollment crisis in the late 70s. At that time, the college added new grad programs. Our enrollment is now less than it was at that time. We must take even bolder actions today and do so on an expedited time frame. Question 6A. We would like more information on faculty layoffs. <laughs> <laughs> They're not letting him go on this. Timing of these layoffs in relation to financial exigency. And for those who are still teaching, <laughs> for those who are still teaching, oh God, how does this change what and how we teach? Thank you. Love this, whoever's asking this question. Hard hitting. Let's see what David does with it. It is a very reasonable request to ask for this information to provide lead time for planning, particularly as this will inform how we teach and how students will learn. We have agreed with the United Faculty of Evergreen that we would not declare financial emergency or exigency in the 2020-2021 academic year. Oh my God. 
So that they, they made a deal with the union to not declare exigency so that the, these union people can keep their jobs even though enrollment is, is falling. So the faculty can keep their jobs for one more year as enrollment is falling before the layoffs actually happen, which probably speeds up the layoffs in a certain respect or makes them even deeper because they are losing all that, all that money in that year. To continue, the decision whether or not to do so after the academic year ends is with the Board of Trustees, who are a bunch of soggy man. Board of Trustees, they're the ones who allow bridges to run this place into the ground. They're the ones who ignored all the students that cried out against the direction of the college. They completely ignored the criticism of the equity push. And they, they completely put all their faith and trust into George Bridges for some freaking reason. So it's up to them to make a smart decision, which they haven't done in years and years. Administration and United Faculty of Evergreen are in close conversations about the college's financial footing. <laughs> I don't know if it's footing anymore, guys. We recognize the importance of being timely with these challenging decisions, which we won't answer right now because I can't actually make that decision for you, but I will point between the lines that this is out of my hands. Question seven, is there a plan B? <laughs> is there a plan B? Is there a plan B in the case of financial exigency? And what are you willing to share? <laughs> we may never need a plan B, but we should have it thought out, right? Answer, plans in the event of financial exigency are spelled out in Article 23 of the Collective Bargaining Agreement. Any deviations from the CBA would be worked out in bargaining with the UFE. See also 7C below. Question 7A. Have there been conversations with other institutions about merging with another institution? Answer, no. We have not yet had conversations of this kind. We are in conversations with several institutions about partnerships that will facilitate the transition of students to Evergreen. See question six for more details. Question 7b. It appears that we are avoiding financial exigency, but are there benefits we haven't considered? CWU, Central Washington University, went through this process last year. Do we know why and what they gained from that? Answer, the only purpose for a declaration of financial exigency is to move to the Faculty Reduction in Force article in the Faculty CBA. It does not serve any other purpose that would bring financial relief. Question 7, 6, uh, 7C. Based on the breakout room discussion on the question of what are the plans for worst case, I would add that we need to plan for strategic cuts rather than cr across the board cuts. Answer, we are planning for strategic restructuring of work areas and functions over a two-year period to gain efficiencies as a smaller college in order to balance the budget. The worst case scenario is that we fail to initiate substantive change through new academic directions to what we offer and how in a way that attracts new students in the next two years. So I guess they have two years. Years. If that happened, we could well lose agency over how we offer degrees to future students on our campus. That is, that is a weird way of putting it. So if they don't turn around enrollment in two years, they could well lose agency over how we offer degrees to future students on our campus. Lose agency over how we offer degrees to future students. I guess the uh, outside agency is going to tell them what to teach and how or they won't be able to offer degrees. See, and this is the problem. If you're looking at Evergreen, you're like, well, can I complete four years there? Can I do this in four years? I, I think that older uh, students who are looking for just professional advancement can use this and not rely on it, but it's thoroughly unreliable now. If a student starts this fall, they have no promises that in two years the college won't initiate some sort of outer agency coming in and then declaring how they offer degrees. And to not tell that to students is morally reprehensible. But they can't afford to tell that to students. So, of course, they're going to tell the students that, yeah, we can totally offer you a four-year degree because we will be around in four years. But here, they can't say that they can do that. So, they're, they're, if they don't tell the students this that are coming in, they are lying to the students. State institution lying to the students in order to keep afloat. Huh. Question nine. How can we improve Evergreen website, e.g. student access to pathway pages, program pages, and fix dead links, etc.? Well, remember earlier that they, they cut out the computer, the computing and, and uh, communication guy. 
Well, faculty, get to work. Hope you guys learn to code at some point because we need that skill right now. Our website functionality has improved in terms of search and speed and more work is underway. We have staff who are working on fixing broken links and other issues as they became become aware of them. We are building system level infrastructure to generate path and pages and program pages based on faculty entries in the curriculum management database so that these issues will not require so much manual maintenance from the web team and cat leaders. More improvements are coming early in the spring quarter with further enhancements by fall 2021. Question 9a. I'd like to know current thinking about how to address all the issues related to supporting the needs of part-time students to experience a path of study from introductory to advanced. It's interesting that that's not the first question. And then the, you know, the website is the, a, a nested question. Answer, in spring quarter, we plan to address this question directly. Right now, I'm just going to be fishy, wishy-washy, which is the entire George Bridges administration. Not spineless, just serpentine. We're going to get direct eventually. Next quarter, soon. Trademarked. We will form a work group that will create a comprehensive plan and policies and name it something awesome, like open to the world now, Evergreen. I just made that up. To support students who wish to find pathways to degree in part-time and through remote online or low residency learning. That's what I was saying. That's your best bet. And then that avoids you having to lie to students seeking a four-year degree, which is what you're going to be doing now, which is what you have already been doing about promising a four-year degree that you cannot promise, but that you have to promise because to not to promise that won't allow you to get out of the hole that you've beached yourself into. Maybe I was a bit of the wind. We need to be able to develop and promote a plan by winter 2022 to have an impact on enrollment by fall 2022. We will draw on the expertise of our faculty who have familiarity with teaching students who attend part-time or with teaching reduction credit options and will remote or online modalities. I feel really bad for the staff, man. They're like, when are we going to lose our job? And Evergreen's like, you might not lose your job if you do a little bit more work. Just do a little bit more work. All hands on deck. And we might not go aground. I guess we're already beached, but, you know. We can't, pay, we can't promise you uh, overtime. But we can try to get the state to pitch in, which we have, which is the only reason we still exist now. <laughs> I feel bad for you guys. Question 9C. The successful growth programs like NPP, New Project Personhood, I don't know, or NAP, New Academic Directions, NPP, have, strong, have built strong relationships with tribal communities. Beyond marketing, what is being done can we do to build stronger community relationships that will bring potential students to Evergreen? So how can we mac on the native communities and promise them four years degrees that we can't really promise? How can we get some of that money, which is probably like heavily funded by the, the state and the federal government? Hmm. Cash cow. MPP and Tacoma are doing a great job of building connections to their respective communities. The success of NPP in recruiting and retaining students is also attributable to a change in how the curriculum is put together and delivered. The college is building partnerships with community colleges to create on-ramps and bridges between their pathways and our paths so that students might other ways stop at an AA, see a natural progression and opportunities for a four-year degree that we can't really promise right now, and future career opportunities by attending Evergreen. Actually, they can promise a four-year degree if you if you already have two years. <laughs> we can give you a four-year degree if you already have two years. They can promise that. I think. Our successful public events at the historic Lord Mansion pre-pandemic brought the community closer to Evergreen. George Bridges and admissions have recently reached agreements with local school superintendents to partner in direct outreach to all high school seniors in their school district with an offer of assured admission if they apply to those who qualify. Oh, God. So they, they can really easily mac on Olympia school districts and not promise them four years. Ouch. George George is also in contact with leadership of the Puget Sound ESD, which covers all of King and Pierce counties to extend this partnership to them. Whew. Question 9D. Isn't that interesting? There's so many nested questions and they led with the website one. Hmm. D. 
Why don't we ask alumni friends for direct contributions to support us at this very unusual time? <laughs> good proposal. We are doing this. <laughs> we are fortunate to have many good relationships with alumni and friends. As long as we keep them in the dark by suppressing one alumni's work uh, by delisting it from Google. Thank you, Evergreen, for spending your hard-end government funding on suppressing an alumni voice, a citizen of the United States and of Washington State. Okay, typically donations are not given to offset operating deficits. They sometimes do offer the opportunity to support new initiatives that will lead to new students, such as with the Celtic and the new Climate Action and Sustainability Center. Question 9E. If the college does go through a bad time... If, if we're just honest and say that we're going through a bad time and we close, how do we help students with incomplete degrees? Here we go. How do we be honest? The college is not closing, comes the answer, nor do we expect to in the future, as long as everything works out in our favor. We are making a commitment to our students that we will provide clear pathways to degree. One way we are doing this is with our PATHS project. We must also do this for online and part-time PATHS so we can serve more working adults. New Academic Directions is intended to provide new learning opportunities that will reach new students. Okay, so they invented this thing so that they can point to it as their savior. New Academic Directions! It's our path forward! Default to that. If they ever get you into a corner, David McAvetty, just say, we got something that works. It's called New Academic Directions, or NAD. That said, to continue, we are at a critical moment in our history, okay? <laughs> that said... <laughs> if we don't develop and implement a clear plan for improved enrollment in the next year, we are in danger of losing our agency and determining the way in which the college offers opportunities for our students to learn and how our campuses may be used. Okay, so we're not closing. We will just lose all power over our institution. Okay, so I guess the state is ensuring that students can get a four-year evergreen degree, but it's not going to be evergreen anymore. It is not enough to continue what we have been doing the way we have been doing it, which basically is inventing a new acronym and then putting all their eggs in that basket over and over and over again, which is what they're doing again. We must change. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to get a group, a working group together and put a bunch of post-it notes on a board and make a mural. They actually did this. They just made a mural. I went looking for that glorious mural, but I couldn't find it. Uh, the PDF that I had saved of all of the post-it notes and clever drawings that they did together as some sort of art project to save their college uh, got lost in the shuffle. But I found documents related to new academic directions slash big bets slash blue sky initiative and one continuing pattern of behavior at the Evergreen State College is that they keep on lying to themselves about enrollment. See here in the bottom right, they have all these estimations. And those estimations are like given like we have good news and not so good news. But actually, by this year, it's, it's way down here. This is, where, this is where they are. So they keep on lying to themselves about their trajectory, which doesn't make it into their drawings or their PowerPoints. Question 9F, could the college rent buildings back to the state? Yes, we are looking at making use of facilities that are underused for this purpose. Finally, G, have we approached the legislator and the governor regarding the direction on how to get Evergreen out of this crisis? The legislator has been floating you guys. Every year they, they give you more money. The budget at the state level is not doing too good, though, guys. It doesn't seem, to continue with this question, it doesn't seem like we can internally turn the tide. We need exterior support and guidance from the state. Our president and government relations officer are in close communication with stakeholders. I don't like how they say stakeholders all the time. In the legislator and governor's office. Stakeholders, what does that mean? People who have our backs, basically. Our board of trustees include a former state senator and a former senior advisor to Governor Inslee. Oh, maybe that's why this whole thing is just continuing the way that it's going. Because it's all a part of Governor Inslee's plan to implement equity statewide. Evergreen was their test run. It blew up in their faces, and they can't afford... 
They cannot afford to admit fault with equity because the governor, despite the public voting against an equity office, is implementing an equity office and Evergreen was their flagship and it totally went aground. But we got people on the inside that have our backs to continue. Our finances are public documents which are reviewed annually by the Office of Financial Management. We will be working with them closely over the next year to keep them apprised of our situation. <laughs> and that is Evergreen Run Aground. Thank you for tuning in to my channel. Here is a cat video. I will see you soon. Parkour Bodie.